the Houston Ship Channel, the second busiest port in the nation, a port providing access to the Gulf of Mexico, supporting over 6,400 ships and 100,000 barge movements annually. Because of tremendous growth in the baytown Laporte area, the Fred Hartman Bridge was built and opened to traffic in 1995. As a result, the Baytown Tunnel was closed at the same time. To stay competitive with other port facilities in the country and to improve safety, the Port of Houston Authority decided to deepen and widen the Houston Ship Channel. The intended profile of the widened and deepened channel conflicted with the existing tunnel elevations, so over 1,000 feet of the tunnel had to be removed. The Houston Ship Channel, the port to Houston, one of the largest import-export channels in the world. As traffic increased on the Houston Ship Channel, there were three ferries traveling back and forth that constituted a definite hazard. The safety answer to this hazard was the baytown Laporte Tunnel. It became the only vehicular crossing of the ship channel between the Turning Basin and Galveston Bay. The tunnel proper would be 3,009 feet between the approach portals. While the sections were being fabricated, the trench on the channel floor was dredged to a maximum depth of 91 feet below mean low water. Near the north portal, the ventilation building was an integral part of the tunnel portal section. The work was let in two contracts at a combined cost of just under $10 million. The contracts covered the subaqueous tubes, the dredging of the trench, and placing the excavation in the roadway approaches across Black Duck Bay, Blackwell Peninsula, San Jacinto Bay and Spillman Island, as well as the cut and cover sections, the open approaches, the tile lining throughout the tunnel proper, the ventilation building, the mechanical and electrical equipment, the repair and fire truck garage near the north portal, and a crash truck garage near the south portal. The steel outer shell of the nine tubes was fabricated at the shipyards of the Consolidated Western Steel Company at Orange, Texas. The ends of the tubes were closed by temporary steel bulkheads launched into the Sabine River, partially ballasted by reinforcing steel to be used later in the reinforced concrete lining. The tubes were then towed through the Intracoastal Waterway, Galveston Bay, and the Houston Ship Channel, ultimately to be sunk into place and sealed together by their specially designed joints. During the oil boom of the 1980s, Highway traffic greatly increased as masses of people moved to the Houston Bay Area. The sheer number of vehicles soon proved to be too much for the two-lane tunnel to handle. The solution? The Fred Hartman Bridge. The eight-year project opened to the public with four lanes of traffic in each direction and a bridge capacity of up to 200,000 vehicles per day. With one of the world's longest main spans, the cable stage Ship Channel Bridge instantly became a Houston landmark. The Fred Hartman Bridge also received recognition for engineering excellence by the American Consulting Engineers Council. The ribbon cutting for the Fred Hartman Bridge was held on September 27, 1995, 42 years to the day of the opening of the Baytown Laporte Tunnel. The opening ceremony to the Texas-sized bridge was long awaited, with Governor George W. Bush on hand, as well as former Commissioner and former Houston Mayor Bob Lanier, Baytown Mayor Pete Alfaro, and many others, the lifelong dream of the late Fred Hartman was realized. The vast expanse is held up by double diamond-shaped towers that are as tall as a 45-story building and rises more than 175 feet above the water. With the new Fred Hartman Bridge in place, it was now time to remove the Baytown Laporte Tunnel. In August 1997, the Texas Department of Transportation awarded Williams Brothers Construction Company an $18 million contract for removal of the Baytown Laporte Tunnel. The job required removal of over a thousand feet of the 3,000 foot long tunnel abandonment and backfill of the access portals on both ends, removal of access roads and bridges, and demolition of the facility buildings. To make things challenging, the section of tunnel to be removed was in the center and bottom of the Houston Ship Channel. 
92 feet below the surface of the water and buried beneath 200,000 cubic yards of sand and silty clay. On top of that was the ship channel traffic, the most important fact that influenced the method and removal process. Over 300 vessels crossed through the project location on a daily basis. The largest oil tankers with their tugboat supports take up over half of the available width of the channel. So, with only five 12-hour closures allowed for the entire contract, the process began. The first contract was bid on but not awarded to Jalco Incorporated because of several obstacles within it. Project had been let. A contractor had come in with a, with a plan that required a, a large number of closures of the ship channel, which the ship channel, in, in my simple mind, is like the West Loop of freeways, except it's in the water. There's a whole lot of traffic that goes back and forth through the ship channel. It costs a lot of money to move that those products, and if you disrupt that operation, then you know, there's a good possibility somebody's going to want to be compensated for the delays or damages. When the contractor came in with a, uh, just an enormous number of closures, um, it became necessary to re review what was done, and I believe another contract was led. The contract was then rebid and awarded to Williams Brothers, and in it there were two options to remove the tunnel. The coral reef option required that the tunnel sections be maneuvered down 50 miles of channel out into the gulf, then sunk to the bottom. Most importantly, the channel was too shallow for the tunnel to go through. The potential liability and safety concern, should the tunnel have sunk and become a navigational hazard, was deemed too risky by the contractor. For that reason, the second option was chosen, and the tunnel was demolished on site. The shape of the tunnel is circular, with a 34-foot, 10-inch outside diameter, a half-inch thick exterior steel shell, and a reinforced concrete lining which varied in thickness from 2 feet 9 inches on the ceiling to a maximum of 5 feet on the sides. An 18 inch thick reinforced concrete slab made the surface of the two lane 22 foot wide roadway. With the help of computer animation, this is the overall process of removing the tunnel. Cut and remove a wedge shaped section, placing it onto the shore so that clearance is given for the next section. A 500-ton crane is used to lift the wedge out of the channel. Cut the first full-sized piece and, after pumping out the water, float the section to the surface. This is repeated with each of the next three sections. Each section makes a quarter-turn roll to the left as it comes up because of the shift in center of gravity on the collar. After it reaches the top, use tugboats to position and guide it to the shoreline. Because of the tide, some of the sections are turned with the flow to make them easier to move through the channel. Because of water depth and almost zero visibility in the channel, the decision was made early on to do as much work as possible from the inside of the tunnel. Cleaning the lead residue from vehicle exhaust off of the tile was required so that the demolished insides would be environmentally safe. The tunnel, with all interior concrete in place, was negatively buoyant and weighed approximately 30 tons per linear foot. To achieve a 10% positive buoyancy so that the tunnel would float, the interior sidewalks, roadway, and support ledges had to be removed, which reduced the weight from the original 30 to just about 24 tons per linear foot. The tunnel was divided into four long sections and a wedge for a total of five separate pieces that needed to be removed from the ship channel. The length of each section was determined by the amount of buoyancy needed to raise it to the surface. Bulkheads were built into the ends of each section so they could be made airtight. They were 30 inches thick, contained 60 cubic yards of 5,000 psi super plasticized concrete and 25,000 pounds of reinforcing steel almost 420 pounds per cubic yard. A single row of number 10 dowel bars were drilled and epoxied on 6 inch to 12 inch centers around the circumference of the tunnel for shear resistance. No additional shear keys were used. The overall bulkhead was designed to withstand approximately 55 psi of hydrostatic force and 35 psi of explosive blast overpressure. 
Each bulkhead also had a 4x8 watertight door similar to a submarine door for access, as well as pipe penetrations for water discharge, the air jet system, and electrical cables. The doors were placed on the cut side of the bulkhead, so the external water pressure would help seal it. We had a situation after removal of a couple of the tunnel sections that we had a leak uh, through one of the watertight doors. Probably one of the scariest times on the job because the leak through the watertight door it came between the concrete and the neoprene seal that was between the steel door and the concrete. And we were down there working with a crew. We had been squirting water for, you know, a day or so. And all of a sudden it started to hum very loud. It sounded very strange. And uh, I made everybody get out of the tunnel. Uh, we closed the watertight doors and we didn't know if the hum was going to be catastrophic if the wall was going to collapse or, or what was going to happen. It was quite nerve-wracking. We uh, watched it for another couple hours and then went back down inside the tunnel and listened from the outside, a couple bulkheads further away from where this leak was, and then went back into that section of the tunnel to try and figure out what it was, why it was doing what it was doing, and determined that it was water rushing between the steel and the concrete making the neoprene seal vibrate, and that's why it had the hum that it had. We ended up sealing that from the outside using an underwater epoxy to get the leak to stop. Bulkhead concrete was placed in a single pour using a concrete pump. At the top of the tunnel, the pump discharge hose was attached to a specially built form and pumped under pressure until full contact with the ceiling was achieved. A total of 12 bulkheads were built. Within each tunnel section, two divider walls were built from the bottom reaching 12 feet high. This created three tanks that would be filled with water ballast to keep each section in place during dredging and after each piece was cut loose. Each tank was around 80 feet long with an average depth of 9 feet and contained 100,000 gallons of water. These tanks were designed with sufficient volume to hold down the tunnel during excavation. To provide access over the ballast tanks, a 6 foot wide walkway was also constructed that ran the full length of each section. With any landmark that has been around as long as the tunnel has, legends arise. This one stayed to the end. Early on in the uh, contract, we were breaking out roadway concrete inside the tunnel. And one of our employees, a gentleman named Clarence Williams, was going to work uh, that morning. And he went down to the tunnel to open up the gates so that we could go in. This was 6, 6.30 in the morning. And uh, he was opening up the gates before we came to work. As he walked towards the gate to open it, he saw down inside the tunnel, we had lights inside that you know, were on 24 hours a day, but inside the tunnel, he saw a man standing there with his back to him, standing there inside in a pair of blue jeans and you know, dungarees, whatever, and with an old metal round hard hat and a metal lunch pail, like you'd see construction workers back in the late 40s, early 50s. And he saw the man standing there looking into the tunnel at the work that we were doing. And he turned around and ran back out of the tunnel. After 50 years at the bottom of the channel, overburden had to be removed before exhuming the tunnel. While concrete removal continued inside the tunnel, dredging procedures began. To track and quantify the dredging process, Trimble's HydroPro hydrographic survey software was used. Field data was taken on a bi-weekly to weekly basis to analyze progress. A 12-inch hydraulic suction dredge with a 160-foot long ladder performed the majority of the overburden removal, which was both tedious and time-consuming. The dredged materials were then pumped over a mile away through polyethylene pipe onto Alexander's Island, a dredge disposal facility. The first piece to be removed was on the south side of the channel and shaped like a wedge, 15 feet across at the top and 5 feet across at the bottom. Removal of the wedge was to provide a relief area when the second section was taken out. A 500-ton derrick crane called Big John was brought in to remove the 125-ton section by lowering a lifting beam through a hole that was blasted in the top of the tunnel. Millions of vehicles had driven through this tunnel for 50 years, but this was the first time a full-sized cross-section, a slice of the tunnel, had been seen. There were six cuts that had to take place to separate all five sections of the tunnel. Several methods were considered for cutting the half-inch steel into pieces, but a linear shape charge was the safest and most practical way. The way the steel shape charge works is the apex here of the steel shape charge 
it's sitting against the surface. When the shape charge is detonated, the apex of this piece of pipe unfolds and it forms a jet. And by the time it reaches the surface of the material, it's a jet just like a torch. And the size of the shape charge is based on the thickness of the material you're trying to cut. A linear shape charge, or LSC, is a directional explosive designed to cut steel with the most minimal amount of explosive in a precise area. Because it is only designed to cut steel, all of the concrete had to be removed from the inside circumference of the tunnel where the charges would be mounted, leaving only a half inch of steel between the ship channel and the workers. So these pre-bent sections of steel shape charge were all placed around the interior circumference of the tunnel against the steel plate of the tunnel. And then detonators would be connected to them. We had two detonators in each piece so that if something happened to one detonator, there was a backup detonator. And every piece of the 110 foot of tunnel was basically detonated simultaneously. Ninety-two feet above the tunnel, on a barge in the middle of the ship channel, preparations were being made to detonate 32 pounds of explosives. Waiting on, we're waiting on a phone call. Uh, waiting on the blast crew to finish getting out. Uh, they were uh, they called me a few minutes ago and they were closing the last door. And uh, as soon as they get out and call me, uh, we'll be ready to go. Transportation Commissioner Johnny Johnson along with TxDOT Houston District Engineer Mr. Gary K. Treach and Williams Brothers Construction Company President, Chairman and CEO Mr. Doug Pitcock boated out to the barge on the morning of September 14, 1999 to witness the raising. After all system checks had been made, all personnel cleared from the tunnel and the watertight doors closed, a phone call was placed to the blast crew positioned outside the entrance on the north side of the tunnel and the shape charges were detonated. Now it's a waiting game. Tunnel section number five has been severed, free to rise up from the bottom of the channel. It could come up as soon as the water is pumped out of the ballast tanks, or because of additional siltation from ship traffic, as well as the shock wave from the blast, it could stay stuck to the channel floor and have to have air pumped through holes in the bottom of it to break it loose. This is the last section of the tunnel to be removed from the channel, and with 24-hour communication with all ship channel traffic, Relief is in sight with the anticipation of having this phase of the tunnel removal completed. Divers were used throughout the process. Before detonation, they retrieved electrical cables for all pumps, attached all hose connections for the air vent lines, and opened valves for the water discharge. All of this was completed in about a week with practically no range of vision. Well, it's nothing new for us, you know. Most of the time, uh, we work at zero visibility. After the linear shape charges were detonated, but before the water was completely pumped out of the ballast tanks, the divers were sent down to inspect the cut to make sure the circumference was completely detached. There were three systems designed to monitor and remove the tunnel. Water discharge pumps, which were at the bottom of each ballast tank and controlled from the barge. An air jet system that would blow pressurized air through pipes and hoses to help break the adhesion between the tunnel and the bottom material through a series of holes and closed-circuit TV cameras, also controlled from the barge, that could pan, tilt, and zoom so that constant monitoring could take place during water removal from the ballast tanks and even bulkhead inspection after the tunnel cuts were made. Bottom, Roger. Roger, leaving bottom. Roger, easy on the diver. theory and all of the planning and all of the calculations there is still an element of the unknown when will this tunnel section come up 
the ship channel was closed at 8 a.m. for a maximum of 12 hours. During this time, the Coast Guard watches the perimeter area to keep people from treading into dangerous waters, with occasional confrontation. By 1 o'clock, the water had been completely pumped out of all three ballast tanks, and the air jet system started up. If the suction does not break loose soon, there will not be enough time to get the tunnel out of the channel before the 12-hour closure expires. If that happens, the section will have to be refilled with 100,000 gallons of water so that it will not unexpectedly pop up until another closure can be arranged on another day. In the meantime, more waiting. Any sign of tunnel movement would be welcome, whether it's the air jet hoses coming up, the pneumatic gauges changing depth, or the sudden shift of water seen through the cameras from inside the tunnel. At 4.20 in the afternoon, after three and a half hours of blowing air and almost reaching the expiration of the closure, and only 10 seconds from the time the tunnel started moving to when it emerged, the final tunnel section broke the surface of the ship channel. Having been positioned on a barge in the middle of the ship channel for up to a week for each removal, this section took longer to come up than any other piece of the tunnel. It was on November 17, 1998 that the wedge cuts were made. Two days later, on the 19th, the wedge was removed by crane. Tunnel section number two was removed a little over two months later on January 29, 1999. Section number three came up the fastest the tunnel cut took place on April 16th. Then on the 17th, after only a couple of hours of water removal, it popped up. June 25th was section number four's date of resurrection. Four and a half hours after blasting the cut, it was floating on the surface. Finally, three months later, on September 14th, 1999, section number five was up. From the start of the contract in January of 1998, to removal of the last section was one year and ten months. Using tugboats attached to the tunnel with ropes, the section was maneuvered over to the side to be demolished. But getting it there took more than just pushing it in the right direction. Thought was given to the position of the tunnel to achieve the least amount of resistance from the tide. We tried to plan everything to where the current was always an inbound current because it was a lot slacker current. Theoretically, we tried to do it at slack tide, and uh, that never happened. But we did try and avoid knot and a half current on the surface uh, every time. At 5.30 p.m., two and a half hours early, the ship channel was reopened. A total of five 12-hour closures were allowed for the entire project, totaling 60 hours. Only 15 hours were used, meaning with the incentive-disincentive bonus penalty, Williams Brothers was awarded $7,000 for every hour they beat the 60-hour maximum. A demolition area was excavated on the south shoreline of the channel, well out of the way of ship and barge traffic, taking it from 10 feet to approximately 40 feet deep and 175 feet wide. After each section was floated to the shoreline, it was secured with cables. The 35-foot diameter, 7,000-ton tunnel floats like an iceberg with six or seven feet above water and the remaining 28 to 29 feet below water. Beginning demolition was all done from barges while the sections were in a floating condition. The demolition process began by breaking a 30-foot by 15-foot slot into the top of the tunnel, then removing all of the walkways, pumps, cameras, and lights. The concrete separation walls for the ballast tanks were also broken out. 
From the outside of the tunnel, 7,500-pound hoe rams and concrete crushers started breaking up the concrete lining. The concrete would fall to the inside of the tunnel section to be picked up later and loaded into a modified truck bed and removed by crane. As concrete was chipped away, the steel shell was cut back even more, making a wider opening in the top. The tunnel also started floating higher as more of the 3,000 cubic yards and 560 tons of steel was hauled away. When the breakers could no longer efficiently work from the barge, they were lowered into the floating section to finish the concrete removal process. Because the tunnel was still floating, water discharge pumps were very crucial. Leaks were a, a numerous process. The holes that we had drilled through the bottom of the tunnel for our air jet system to remove it were also holes to the water that leaked while we were inside breaking concrete. So we had to drive plugs into those holes and pumps were constant. Multiple float-controlled electric pumps were backed up by gas-powered pumps in the event there was a power outage. Plus, they were monitored 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To finally get a tunnel section out of the water, a ramp was excavated on a 5% slope with steel beams acting as a sliding surface. But before this could happen, a reduction in weight from 7,000 to 650 tons had to take place. Once it did, the tunnel was dragged up the ramp and the part sticking out of the water was cut off. This was repeated until demolition was complete. This is a piece of one of four sections of the tunnel. The concrete has been chipped away, the metal has been reduced to small pieces using a cutting torch, and this is all that's left. All steel was scrapped, and the concrete rubble was recycled into roadway base material. The removal of the Baytown Laporte Tunnel was a challenge of a lifetime. The project was bid based on a conceptual set of plans, which ended up being completely revised. And those revised plans were derived from pure theory, then brought to reality. Many ideas and methods from different industries were adapted into one unique and successful project. Many thanks to all of the dedicated employees, subcontractors, and vendors who helped make this project a success.